Live from the Sands Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at AWS reInvent 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsors, Amazon and Trend Micro. Okay, hey, welcome back everyone. We are live in Las Vegas for Amazon Web Services reInvent. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the steam from the noise. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, founder of SiliconANGLE. Our next guests are entrepreneurs, Kai Elzamani, co-founder and CEO, uh, Christine and Patrick, Colin Cherry, yep, is that Colin it? Did you get that? Co-founder and CTO. Um, so guys, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Glad to be here. I like you sporting the Google Glass there. It's very, very awesome. Represent you, my are company. We, are you recording this right now? Yes. Okay, so inside yeah, We're getting all meta. We're, we're okay. recording the cameras, we're recording all of you. I think, I think this is actually a first. We had someone on, uh, on Google Glass, but they weren't recording, so we're going to have to have a, a show within the show. Um, so, what do, you think, what do you think about the show so far? I want to get your perspective on the vibe, what you take, anything you capture on Google Glass, feel free to share that. What do you think? Yeah, the energy is great um, here at Amazon at reInvent. The energy is really great. There's a lot of awesome people that we've met, um, you know, just throughout the day, couple of days. Um, both people who are, you know, working on some really good, cool projects. For instance, the guys at Rancher over there, um, and just some really awesome value adds that we can get, um, and some awesome ideas. So. So, what's the coolest thing you see? Give us the rank order, top three hottest uh, things. Is it the provisioning tool, Apollo? Is it Aurora? Is it uh, the container. Lambda, that's, that's, uh, that's the thing that I find coolest. Uh, I'm a big fan of functional languages and just functional programming. Lambda, as a whole. you like the Lambda. Yeah, it, it, it appeals to me as a mathematician, so I mean, it's just it's really cool. That's just that ability to parallelize everything and just you know, run functions themselves as, you know, as essentially as a service, which is awesome. Um, you know, the containers are also pretty cool, I mean, given how much we use Docker. Um, you know, it's a pretty awesome service. Um, so we're just it's all around of, excited. It's more of a cognitive dissonance thing. So, yeah, good to see Docker. Golf clap, keep going, keep rolling. Yeah, they're, it's they're just, just they're thundering away with momentum. Yeah. Kyle, what about you? What do you what do you see as the hottest, and what have you captured on Google Glass? That's the craziest thing you've seen. You should have seen us backstage. We're getting ready for the keynote that Patrick was giving this morning. It was really funny to see to see everyone running around. You had the senior executives, you had the young startups. Uh, and then I was watching Werner kind of in between, uh, you know, because he was on and off the stage the whole time. He had three assistants, kind of one person patting him down with a towel for sweat, one person with makeup. One person reviewing slides. Yeah, and some Advils too. He's popping all kinds of like, you know. Right. <laughs> Werner, Werner really burns a midnight oil. He's out with customers. I saw Andy Jassy rolling up the elevator last night at uh, you know 12:30. You know, these guys aren't like you know one and done. Do the keynote, go, to, yeah. go on their jets. They're working it. I mean, they're really yeah. working hard. It was it was a it was a production to see Warner getting prepped for the whole thing. It was awesome. <laughs> what was he like? And he's bigger than everyone there. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's like it's everyone is reaching up to him to do. All this. right, so guys, talk about the company. What are you guys doing? Uh, what's the big innovation for you guys here within Amazon that you guys are, are talking about? Yeah, the, uh, so we write software for Google Glass uh, for use in really healthcare and enterprise settings. We're trying to pioneer the future of the wearable worker. Uh, so a lot of traditional jobs that kind of require you to use your hands, field service, anything in healthcare, manufacturing, a lot of these jobs, people are unable to use a computer to look up information, to record things, to get expertise. And so we're kind of pioneering all the the kind of basic things you're going to want to do with smart glasses for the wearable worker. Our uh, primary use cases today are in field service and remote collaboration. So we help whoever's wearing the glass can share what they're seeing live and securely to any other device anywhere in the world. And using that, then they can get kind of remote help and expertise. So to give you some context, so one of our customers is a large manufacturer of conveyor belts. And uh, if those can, their customers are Coke, Pepsi, Honda, a lot of big companies. Yeah. When those conveyor belts aren't working, those factories are losing tens of millions of dollars per day. And so they're using our technologies now whenever the conveyor belt goes down to remotely diagnose and fix the conveyor belt to drive ROI. So basically the software you guys are powering, it's all cloud, is it born in the cloud? 100%. Yeah. What are you guys using for uh, tools? Beanstalk, EC2, all the normal stuff? No, we actually use EC2. Um, we use Ansible for configuration management and we use Docker everywhere. Um, pretty much every single service that Pristine runs is runs on top of Docker. It's been a huge, huge help for us for our DevOps organization to go create um, a more scalable architecture that's easily managed. Um, 
And How so, big is the company? How many people you guys have? Right now we're at we're at 18, 18 or 19 people yeah. right now. A number I think we'll be at 23 by the end of the year. And you guys are located where? Austin, Texas. Yep. So you're in Texas. Okay, cool. So we're just down there for Dell World. The uh, I got to ask you because one of the things I'm really been big on, and Mark Hopkins, who's uh, you know with Silicon Angle, is, is uh, besides Bitcoin, is wearables. We, we before that was really augmented reality, that beginning yeah. trend. So guys, talk about why this whole augmented reality thing is real. People now can put Oculus Rift to this, um, this virtual space, using technology, connecting, internet of things. It's all kind of coming together. You kind of, you know, you've seen the progression. Give us your take on, on why uh, this is happening, why it's important, what are key validation points of these, and connect the dots for that trend. Yeah, absolutely. So with kind of glasses, there's a lot of movement happening. There's a lot of augmented reality talk. AR is still a long way away, in our opinion, from really commercial viability. There's a lot of great tech demos, but getting it consistent and reliable in the field is a lot harder than doing a tech demo. VR is going to come first. Oculus, they have enough money now, for sure, to make it happen. That's also, I'd argue, less, a less challenging technical problem. Computer vision with you know, smart laying over is pretty hard. Uh, but you're going to see it all happen because you know, computers have, by and large, saturated white collar work. Business executives, finance guys, creatives, writers, accountants, uh, any white collar job today by and large has kind of hit the computer revolution through and through. Mobile was the last kind of major wave of that with remote sales forces and those kinds of things. But the, the segment of the economy that still is really not touched by computing that much is blue collar, mobile, hands on work. And the emerging growth of new users at worldwide. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, if, to give you a sense, so the Kauffman Foundation, if they've cited in the United States, about 69% of all workers in this country are what they would call blue collar workers and about 31% are white collar, right? So if you think about that in terms of just computing adoption and what computers can do for society, we're still not even close to halfway because desktops and laptops and tablets weren't meant for the mobile, work, the, the wearable, hands-on worker. All right, so that's cool, there's a big market. Big market opportunity. And obviously that white collar worker is going to evolve too. It'd be much more automated, a lot of the, uh, a lot of complexities around interactions changing, so mobile will still give it some headroom there, so you got that new market. Uh, Patrick, talk about the challenges on the software side. How do you guys, I mean, being early can be a death sentence. We all know that as yeah. startups, but you want to try not to be too early. You yeah. want to be practical. So one of the biggest things that we've seen, um, you know, especially with wearables and smart glasses, is that the technology's been around for years. Um, you know, it's just relatively recently with glass and you know, and a couple of other competitors like Musix, that this technology has been in a form that's small enough and in a form factor that's unobtrusive enough for you know the majority of um, enterprise users to actually use. Um, and you know that's that's been the big thing there. What we do see in terms of challenges is that when you miniaturize a technology like this and you start sticking in um, a lot more mobile class processing units and things like that into there, you run into issues like um, things getting too hot, for instance, or um, you know the, another. Actually, another really big underrated challenge on the software side is um, the user experience. Um, people are used to using computers. Using tablets don't, doesn't have a huge amount of friction between that, those two there because um, you know, the UX is fairly well understood. On the other hand, when you put something on your face, you've got this screen in front of your eye that you talk to, it's a bit hard for to convey that to people initially. Um, you know, how to use this and you know, the usability concerns of having this limited screen real estate. So that's, it's been interesting. Uh, well, I mean, you, he had uh, eight and the 45, was it? You were under, no, under 85, you said you were on the glass waiting list when you got the glass. You know, the first wave of Google Glass was kind of hot, then they kind of like, okay, it's not a consumer product, and wave, wave one. Yeah. And I was always asked, and I'm bullish on glass, just for the record, you know, I think, you know, it's got a lot of great, I'm a, I love the futuristic aspect of it. But I was pulling people up on Google and saying, search Apple, too. And you go see Wozniak's first Apple was wooden case. And, yeah. and what Google Glass has done is really kind of good rev one. They're not, it's a good product, right? The screen size is small, I got that. But the real, the application's the key. So I got to ask you, as you guys look at the market, in the industrial space, is there low hanging fruit now? You mentioned manufacturing. We had a, a trend micro customer on the pipeline, construction, this connectivity issues. I mean, these are all kind of like sync software problems. Like, how are you guys looking at that and which markets are the low hanging fruit? Yeah. Great question. So, we actually talk about this all the time internally with our investors, is like, the first commercially successful piece of software ever written was VisiCalc, and that was spreadsheets. All you needed was an X and a Y coordinate and addition and multiplication. And spreadsheets in their most basic form would work in 1978 on the Apple II, right? Cell phones, same thing. Yeah, but that required the user to do their own work, not go to MIS departments and like get like stuff, yeah. so they actually 
democratized. It was democratizing, but it was also kind of like, the, it was the killer app yeah. for yes. desktops, right? And it took 20 years for that to kind of roll out broadly. Uh, cell phones, the killer app was voice, uh, obviously, right? And so when we look at Glass, we kind of try and ask ourselves, what's the thing that in 20 years we all look back on that had some pretty broad horizontal implications uh, and that could solve a lot of big problems in big places, right? Excel was, BusyCalc was so big because those guys used to run Excel by hand. Like, can you imagine running spreadsheets by hand and running, trying to do multivariable analysis of your business? Like, it's crazy. And so, we're pretty confident the answer is video. Um, or what you could more broadly call remote collaboration. So see what I see and help me do this thing in front of me. Yeah, it's very Star Trek-like. I mean, again, everything that's on Star Trek will be invented. That was our cube quote years ago, <laughs> uh, except true. for maybe the you know, transporter room. But if you think about what you guys are doing. You haven't seen I, our time machine? No, okay. Yeah, we've got faces. I want to go back to the 80s and get that hot tub yeah. time machine going, because that's where I'm from. But uh, yeah. you know, in all seriousness, no, Internet of Things is like really much hyped up on the industrial side, but humans are things. So if you look yeah. at the human connectedness, if you're at the edge of the network, now what wearables show is that you now have a kind of a local network on yourself, so I could have a tablet, I could have something uh, you know, connected to my ear, my eye, I could have a phone telling me. So it's not just videos that that's opportunity, it's personalization, right? So if I know context, the data coming in is the notification. So this whole notification API kind of economy is why I think you guys will win. Now, that being said, Amazon is a, a notification cloud, it's all about APIs. Um, is that why you guys are attracted to Amazon, or was it just straight economics? Share with the um, inside. What's awesome about Amazon is that uh, we knew Amazon pretty well. Um, we understood the technology, we understood the services, the APIs, and how to go architect into it. What was an awesome bonus for us is finding out that Amazon actually offers HIPAA compliant services for hosting. And you know, that was really the icing on the cake for us. In addition to that, Amazon really did help us early on when we did need, you know, the funds. You know, you can imagine you're just two guys, you know, in a room without very much money, you know, working out of Kyle's apartment. You know, we don't have very much cash to go build up a robust enterprise grade product. Yeah, yeah. You don't you have know? money to build a data center. No, you we don't have money to build a data center. Micro or, boxes that cost eight grand. Oh each. god, yeah. You know? and, I mean <laughs> for us, just being able to go capitalize upon those resources. Um, you know, and also having the ability to spin up and spin down resources is huge. Um, you know, versus the legacy model and Amazon. So you guys been with Amazon yeah. since the start of the company. Yep, since the start Day of the company. One. What do you guys think they should be doing better? What What are your What's on your wish list? I'd say, uh, you know, I want them to help us commercialize our time machine. <laughs> that's That's true, time machine. I mean, I'd love to see time travel as a service. Um, in all seriousness, one of the things that we'd like to see is um, VPC pairing across regions. That'd be awesome. Uh, mostly, you know, so that we can go expand things out, um, you know, without as much overhead and latency. Um, I mean, overall, we were one of the things that we we're really jonesing for earlier was, you know, Docker. Docker as a service would have been awesome in Amazon. And then, well, hey, here you go. They announced it today, so really, really excited to go see and that. You guys have a lot of Docker experience, right? Yeah, I mean, we've been using Docker for a while. What now. do you like about Docker? I'm going to have Ben call up on the cube later today. CEO, oh, awesome! So yeah. he's been on multiple times. Ben's a great guy. I want to ask him some new questions. So what should I ask him? What do you guys like about Docker? What's exciting? I like for the it? logo. We have a lot of whales <laughs> around our office now. <laughs> so, Logos works. Cool. Yeah. Um, what we really love about Docker is the fact that it helps streamline our DevOps organization and our DevOps process. Um, you know, previously, rather than having to worry about all this dependency management and all these things that are that go into these items when you actually start launching in the cloud and actually scaling out, we can just encapsulate everything and deploy the exact same workloads that we test in development. And that's huge in terms of process optimization because at the end of the day, you know, it's hardware is relatively cheap, but engineering time is expensive. It's inherently expensive. Um, you know, you know so I was talking to a venture capitalist last night and they, and they asked me what I thought was the hot mega trend. And I said, you know what the mega trend is, and I was kind of using Docker as a reference was, yeah. In growing markets, simplification and reducing time it takes to do something. Oh yeah, reducing agility. steps, agility, and just like yeah. just taking away, automating stuff that really isn't that critical. Yeah, that takes time. So Docker does that, right? Yeah, that's why you see so many of these things that are blank as a service. That are yeah. you know, there's a lot more companies in the infrastructure space and you know the infrastructure and operations space for you know data centers and technologies that are just coming up as services that are just providing huge increases in productivity. Yeah. Um, you know, which ends up. Translating into uh, a decrease in you know, All right, so let's, we got to get the question on the glass. So what's the view like? Give everyone a panoramic view. We're getting, getting the cube here. Hey, you know, we're inside the cube. This is the video. <laughs> We've never had actually a video inside the cube, but it's good. Um, what's next? What do you, what do you guys want to do next? What's the next milestone uh, that you're telling your investors and, and the team you're going to be building? Yeah, so the other way we're looking at the future right now is the challenge with building a business around glass is that 
Everyone's super excited about the future. Oh my God, this is amazing. It's going to change my workforce and my operations. But no one's like, yeah, I want 500 glasses tomorrow. They're all like, oh, I want five. No one wants to, to dive in head first. Yeah, it's yeah. just too early. And so kind of, you know, seeing our kind of our early stage customers now evolve from pilots into larger scale rollouts. And uh, the combination of kind of new hardware coming from a number of vendors, as well as kind of getting those POCs really done, the KPIs are being hit and now scaling So you guys that. are, I imagine, rolling out professional services around that, really capturing the, yeah. the POC data, rolling that in the product. Absolutely, so, so we have a kind of a consulting arm to help get our customers yeah, up and running and the get pump. the processes there. So yeah. what, what are you learning from the, when you're priming the pump? Because OpenStack went through this, by the way. I was just talking again yesterday about OpenStack versus Amazon. It's build your own and there's a lot of POCs and it's an, and an obvious future, but the bridge to get there is not pretty clear. So they got to build their own. So what are you learning in your POCs from customers that's on their mind? Maybe separate from the fear of adoption, which is definitely one, but like practically, practical terms, is it infrastructure? Is it uh, software? What are you guys learning about the, the build outs? Yeah. So generally the biggest, single biggest challenge we face kind of operationally is connectivity. Uh, you know, Wi-Fi environments and most of the places people want to do this stuff is usually not all that great. Uh, and so kind of work, we've done all kinds of tricks in both software as well as how we think about networks and deployments and connectivity, and then the business around paying for that to help get our customers there. One of our partners is DataZoom. They provide a phenomenal service for helping us have our customers manage their 4G routers of different carriers in different locations. Uh, so that's been a huge problem. Uh, so I, operationalizing it for the customer yeah. has been the big challenge. We, we're, we're getting close to the point where there's no thinking required, or you know, pretty minimal thinking required, right? And we just want to be able to rinse and repeat. Awesome, and technology-wise, what are you seeing? for um, the customers, it's just standard stuff, or is it, there's no real requirement for the customer to change technology? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a mixture of both just the standard stuff, and I'd say the other side is um, when you start selling to more conservative organizations, you have to go deal with sometimes being the very first vendor in the cloud, yeah, yeah. Um, which is a pretty big standard to go live up to. Um, you know, being the first vendor in the cloud or you know, being the first startup that the organization has dealt with. Yeah. Um, so it's just really emphasizing that our technology is robust. You know, we are enterprise grade. And you guys aren't just built on glass. You're, you're, you're hinting that software is the IP. You guys will then move to other platforms when needed. We have about yeah. six or seven other glasses, devices in our office. We have two right now commercially deployed, Glass and Vuzix. Uh, and we you know, keep our eyes on the others on what we're going to do next. All right, guys, really appreciate you coming in. Great to see the highlight here at uh, Amazon. We are obviously a customer of AWS. We love it. I mean, Glass and Beanstalk, Redis, all that great stuff, queuing. Really, for startups, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it's like, come on, yeah. like, come on. Like, you know, maybe OpenStack for the enterprise. We've been having that debate yesterday, so. Uh, any other parting thoughts you want to share with the folks out there around the show? People who aren't here, besides the energy, what are you seeing? Give some tidbits on, just some observations that you noticed here, uh, besides people staying up really late gambling and partying and like they did last night. You can gamble on credit. <laughs> yeah, that's, there's that's actually a sign in the casino. It's this casino minds. credit, and I was totally shocked that Casinos offer this as a service to gamblers. But um, I'd say the biggest thing I'm seeing is that really like I'm seeing people here from big enterprises that used to be all on-prem and all the big enterprises are spending a lot of money to send their people here. I think at this point the majority of the Fortune, you know, 100, 500, whatever, they are starting to recognize that you can run things in the cloud, not only you know, with less management overhead, but actually at a lower cost and even with improved security and reliability, which those have kind of been the traditional arguments against cloud. And, Seeing that happen at kind of the big Fortune 1000 level here is amazing, and we're, you know, I think we're going to see that trickle down more and more and more to accelerate adoption of technologies like ours that are literally no configuration, no setup, no management required, so you can rethink how to run your business smarter. Patrick, talk about the geek angle on the technology for the geeks out there watching. Like, okay, what's the core things that's popping up that's really cool on the, on the announcements? On, you mentioned Lambda's one. What other things are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, for us, really, Lambda's a huge one. The other one is uh, Code Deploy, that entire deployment pipeline that Amazon's doing. That's, that's something that's really interesting for us. Um, and I'd, I'd actually argue for any sort of organization that follows a CICD type model. Um, and just, just seeing how those improvements can actually be made there. It's, it's, it's really interesting to see. Um, you know, what I also suspect is that that's also going to go increase people's reliance on Amazon. Um, you know, for better or for worse. Because at that, that point, exactly. It's at that point in time, you know, they have an end-to-end -end solution from you know things like repository management, all the way over to deploying these tools, you know, and deploying this technology into the actual cloud itself. And then once you couple things like Elastic Beanstalk, you know, it's the it's end-to-end. -end, it's a full solution. 
It's a developer dream, basically. Yeah, it's, it, it is a developer dream. It's actually, I'd argue, it's an operations dream. That's a, that's a, a big one, too. It's a, well, infrastructure is code. That's true. Right? That's infrastructure DevOps. Infrastructure is code is huge. So it's developer and ops, right? Yeah. So I love that debate. Well, anyway, uh, guys, thanks for coming on. Uh, Patrick and Kyle here with Christine, the founders. You know, startups are making a dent, and that's what the cloud's all about. The, the big guys can be <laughs> taken down by startups, and so you guys, good luck. We'll be following you guys. We've got the Google Glass. Want to get that video, certainly uh, over to Jeff Frick and the team here. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll be right back after this short break. This is theCUBE, live in Las Vegas. I'm John Furrier, we'll be right back.